Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name's Andrew Harcourt. For people who aren't familiar with this, uh, with this particular face, um, thank you for turning up this evening. I know that the weather is not particularly uh, pleasant, and the air conditioning's just twitched itself off, which means that we're in for a uh, a warm and muggy evening. <laughs> we can fix that. Oh wow, we're resourceful here. Um, so. We're here to learn about mobile app development, uh, specifically the professional way to do it. So um, I guess I want to just give people a quick overview of what this talk is about and equally what it's not about. Um, incidentally, the, uh, the edge of frame for video is about here, so I'm just going to totally shun that whole side of the room. Sorry, I chose the wrong side. Um, and I'll talk exclusively to these people because that's what I'm... All right, but if I'm shunning you, that's why. So what are we going to cover in this talk? Um, well, firstly, a quick cringe at the, uh, the status quo. So uh, how do we currently develop mobile apps? Uh, I'm sure everybody's going to have their own war stories to tell there. Um, secondly, we're going to have a look at some of the principles that we actually want to abide by. Now, most of us know good software engineering principles. It's just a matter of how we actually apply them to mobile app development, where, let's be honest, the tool chain still ain't that great. It's better, but it's not wonderful. So let's have a look at that. Um, we'll have a bit of a look, bit of a look at an application structure or a variation on the theme of application structure. Obviously, you're going to have your own opinions on how you should structure your apps. I don't particularly mind. This talk isn't about that. Um, this talk is about how we can take all of the tooling that we have and create one cohesive way of actually you know, putting it all together. Um, you're more than welcome to vary any and all of the particular components or steps. Um, so we'll have a look at some of the tooling that we're using, specifically as well some of the, uh, the JavaScript testing tools. Again, this talk is not about JavaScript testing tools. They're just one part of the whole. Um, and then we'll see if we can get a party trick done. So this talk is not a deep dive into any one particular technology, pattern, framework, anything like that. Right? I'm not going to teach you how to build a particular you know, like, I'm not going to teach you how to build an Angular app. I'm not going to teach you, you know, Hello World. Well, I might show you Hello World in Jasmine or Karma, but that's about all. But we're not going to go deep dive into any one technology. The whole point of this talk is to make sure that we understand, one, what we're trying to achieve as far as being responsible and professional in mobile app development is concerned, and two, one way that we've found that's quite successful in doing just that. So... How do we do it at the moment? Come on, who's been here? Who's done this? First of all, show of hands, who's actually shipped a mobile app? One, two, three, come on, more than that, surely. Five, six, seven, we're not even gonna hit double digits. Okay, why have we not shipped a mobile app? Because it costs 100 bucks and you have to pay Apple every year because it costs 50 bucks a year to pay Google as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so curious then, is it just, is it, firstly, is it just lack of interest? Who just doesn't care? One, why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> One person doesn't care about shipping mobile apps, but turned up anyway, well done. Um, so of everybody else in the room then, why have we not shipped a mobile app? So hands up for uh, no opportunity within current workplace. So that's some. How about just access to tooling? It's hard. Don't know how to get started. Can I get started? Okay, so hands up who hasn't yet put their hand up. Okay. <laughs> I know you've shipped them. Right. Okay, so this is a really, really common story. We hear this a lot. And it's along the lines of, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, there's a critical bug, we absolutely must fix it right now because we're hemorrhaging cash. Something's gone horribly wrong, we're getting laughed at in the media, or we're losing money hand over fist. Worse, we've just done a, you know, we've got a typical sign reversal bug, and instead of taking people's money, we're giving them money, and that's always awkward. Great for them. Um, incidentally, when you do that, like you authorize on a credit card to give it money, um, it doesn't check their account balance to see if they're allowed to have $50. So even if they don't have $50 in their account, you'll still give them $50, and then you try to take away 100 and it won't work. So um, yeah, don't do that. Um, and then we end up in this situation where, oh my god, we've got this critical bug, we have to fix it, and no one quite knows how to actually get the thing out the door. Um, I, and in mobile apps in particular, I mean, 
Uh, show of hands, who uses Octopus? Okay, who does not use Octopus? Okay, who still pastes stuff onto a web server? Who's not brave enough to admit that they still paste <laughs> stuff onto a web server? If you're doing that, you should hand back your compiler license now. Okay, so we should have automated deployment, but in mobile apps it's actually kind of hard because the tooling doesn't make it all that simple. So what we end up with is normally one person has a workstation set up for deploying to production. And once it's ready to go, everyone just slowly and carefully backs away from it and they leave it alone. Because if you breathe on it, it might fall down and then you've got no way of deploying to production and that's really awkward. So for the Apple, like App Store for instance, uh, things like uh, signing certificates. Okay, so who's actually gone and gotten themselves a, an app signing certificate through, the, you know, you know, through Keychain or... Who's actually had to boot into Xcode to do that? Or you know, boot into Mac OS and do that by Xcode? Yeah? Scary place? Happy place? No. It's a mostly happy place now, but it used to be a fairly scary place. Um, but anyway, so we end up in this situation where one person has the machine that does the production deployment or the production build, and off that we get the one true IPA file or the one true APK, and we just hope like crazy that the consumer grade hardware doesn't decide to go bang when we really need it. Because that's a really great thing to bet your business on. Who's seen this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who's written this at some point? <laughs> And come on, who's had like production connection strings hard coded in their version control history? Come on, who's put the SA password under version control? <laughs> come on, fess up. <laughs> right, we know you have, right? Because it's hard. It's hard not to do that. Um, nonetheless, though, this is a really, really scary place to be because there's one thing more scary than uh, writing development data to production, and that's writing production data back to development because it works and nobody really notices that it's not working because it's working right up until someone goes and blows away the development database and then you realize that you've written the last four days worth of production transactions to something that no longer exists and because it's a development scratch copy, there's no backup. Whoops. Who's done that before? <laughs> so what do we care about? What do we care about? What are the principles that we actually care about? Now, the first one is pretty self-explanatory. Anyone who's done any form of continuous delivery before, um, a git push does all the things. Okay? If we git push to either master or if we're doing a, you know, a git flow style thing to a particular release branch or to what, like, whichever branch is going to go live, if you push to that branch, out the door it goes. And that should be the rule for mobile applications as well. There's no reason that it can't be the case except that it's been traditionally quite difficult. It's still not beautiful. I mean, we don't have a really nice integrated continuous integration pipeline. Um, I know that team build, which is being, as far as I understand it, completely rewritten, um, is making inroads towards being able to build Objective-C and stuff in Visual Studio, but you still actually need a Mac slave to it, and it's just all too hard. It's a Rube Goldberg machine again. Um, maybe one day it will be nicely integrated, but I'd actually argue that we don't necessarily want really nice integration, because what's another word for integration in code terms? Coupling. Right, so we want, we want something really nicely integrated. And then if we flip that on its head and say we want, that, we want something really tightly coupled, everyone goes, oh. So maybe what we should be looking at is tools in the tool chain that can be replaced and swapped out as we go. So let's have a look at some of those. Um, only dev settings ever get committed to version control. Never, ever, ever should we commit a production connection string to version control. One, you've just compromised all your production data ever. And if you're using a distributed version control system, you can't, well, it's very, very hard. As soon as someone's done a git fetch, uh, you can't take that history away from them. Right? They have the keys to the castle forever. Now they quit. And you're in the cloud, right? And you've got this whole like, distributed system thing happening, which means you've probably opened up your firewall maybe a little bit more than you should. And so then you've got a disgruntled employee who's quit, but still with the crown jewels, and nobody notices. And that's really good. Um, not to mention, it's really scary as a new developer to just go git clone and hit F5 and see what happens. If what happens happens to be you write a test transaction to whichever database you're currently talking to, which might actually be production. And that's a little bit awkward too. 
Um, and of course you won't know because you won't know where to look yet, so nobody will tell you. And then you'll find that you've been doing this for the first three or four weeks of your employment and all of a sudden everything's gone horribly, horribly wrong. And it's not your fault. Okay? It's not fair to put people in that situation. It's not fair to yourself. And why would you do it to yourself? So let's not. Next principle is the JavaScript you write is not the JavaScript that runs. And this one takes a whole lot of time for .NET developers in particular to get their heads around. Right? You are never going to point your browser at a .js or index.html or whatever file on disk that's the same one that you've opened up in your editor and run it. Just don't do it. If you can accept that that's going to be the case, then life gets a whole lot easier. Who, who writes like nicely decoupled JavaScript? Okay, who writes horrible couple, horribly closely coupled JavaScript? Who writes JavaScript? <laughs> who does not write JavaScript? Okay, who's never seen JavaScript? <laughs> okay, we're getting somewhere. People have seen JavaScript, this is good, okay. So, um, we need to accept that uh, JavaScript, the JavaScript source code that we write is just the same as the C-sharp or I won't pick on VB program is the F-sharp that we write. But we're not going to just point the CLR directly at our C-sharp code or our F-sharp code or anything else like that. We're going to have some kind of compilation or transpilation step in the middle. Accept that, move on, life gets a whole lot easier. As per Larry Curley and Moe's workstation from the, uh, the previous slide, we are never, ever, ever going to release from a development workstation. Who's ever going right-click and publish from Visual Studio? Come on, seriously. Everyone's done it, right? Because it's easy. Who's ever just done, like, you know, right-click, publish, and spun up a new cloud service through Visual Studio? Yeah. Who's seen videos showing you how easy it is to do that? And isn't it awesome? And you should totally go to production like that every day because we're agile, right? Oh, man. Don't. Just don't. Okay? Developer workstations are dirty, dirty places to be. It's where we've got old versions of SDKs installed. Who knows what's in the global assembly cache? And we have no guarantee whatsoever that something that works on my machine is ever going to work in production. So that's why it needs to go through a build server first. And that's the same whether we're talking about you know, compiled code for the CLR or JavaScript or Node, whatever, I don't care. But the same principle applies. Developer workstations are sand pits, and you're not ever going to responsibly deploy from a sand pit directly into production. Okay. We care about F5. Who knows what the F F5 experience is? One, two, three. Okay, who does not know what the F5 experience is? Okay, so I mentioned this a few minutes ago, and I don't have lollies with me, otherwise I'd be rewarding people. The F5 experience is basically how much effort it takes for me to go from git clone through to hit F5 and have the application launch. Okay. And ideally, that's what you want. Git clone, hit F5, Boom, up it comes. That's what we're aiming for. Um, if you must, then we add in one additional step, which is git clone whichever repository, run a reset the world script, and then hit F5. Okay. Your instructions for a new developer should be clone that repository, run the reset script, and launch. Okay. And it should make sense. Oh, but you, know, you have to install this particular you know, SDK and that particular library and that particular charting toolkit and that particular thing and yeah, no, don't do that. Um, so the F5 experience should be really, really simple and pleasant. And the last thing that we really, really care about, which we're not going to touch on too much tonight, but I'm going to say it here just in case we forget it later, instrumentation. Once your app has gone out into the wild, remember you're running your code on someone else's device. It's not like you're running your code on a web server. Sure, you've got an API somewhere but you're running your code on someone else's device and it doesn't work. Now what? How do you figure out what on earth is happening when your app, which is in someone's pocket right now, suddenly goes crash? Okay. That's moderately inconvenient and all they're going to do is give it one star in the app store and say it crashes all the time, boom. All right, and that's not going to be all that helpful either. If you're waiting for Apple to give you crash dumps, you're holding it possibly they're not, you know, not the right way. So instrument early. OK, so app structure. I mentioned that this isn't going to be the focal point of this talk. We don't particularly care about how you structure your JavaScript apps. That said, um, we're going to do a really quick orientation through the app or the, the suite of apps that we'll be playing with this evening. Um, some people will be familiar with this subject matter. Some people won't. Um, you can make all the drunken schoolies jokes you want. Okay. <coughs> 
One of the things that we're looking at is uh, the uh, the Red Frogs group. Who's familiar with Red Frogs? Okay, who's not familiar with Red Frogs? Okay, who's not familiar with Red Frogs yet has a school-aged child? Okay, that's fair enough. Um, so, Red Frogs is a uh, volunteer charity group. Uh, they started out basically uh, concerned with um, schoolies welfare. So basically, you know, fishing drunken schoolies out of the gutter at schoolies and taking them back to their hotels. And it's grown into a... Um, a school student welfare organisation and a bunch of other things since then. Um, they're good people, they do good work, and they have a reasonably good technology stack. It was well written, but it is ageing. Um, and it's been ageing for quite a while, and so we're part, we're part way through doing a technology refresh. So what we're going to have a look at, if I can get Visual Studio onto that screen, hooray, we can, is a really, really quick introduction to the Red Fox code base. This is not open source, I'm sorry we can't open source it, don't know if we're ever going to be able to open source this particular one, but we're going to have a look at some snippets. Okay, so this particular repository, I think I've got some pending changes around ReSharper, um, but basically if I want to launch this application, I hit F5 and two apps should come up. One is the API, which is just going to be sitting there, basically sending HTTP requests and doing nothing else, and one is a Windows service that's spun up using Top Shelf, so as far as we're concerned, it's just a console application. But when it's deployed, it's a Windows service. That makes sense so far? Yeah. Okay. So there's a bunch of technology in here that's probably a subject for a different talk. Uh, we're not going to talk about service bars or distributed systems or anything else in here, but we've, we've covered that in, in our other talks, and there'll probably be yet still other talks about those topics. But for now, just accept that we're communicating via a service bus as far as these applications are concerned. And the one that we really care about is this one. And all it's going to do is be a web API for us. Um, we'll come back to this one structure in a minute, but it's a Nancy FX application. Um, and it's got a few conventions around it. But by and large, it's pretty vanilla Nancy. The next thing we're going to look at is localhost that guy and localhost that guy. Yoink and yoink. OK, and that's probably a little bit bigger than we need it to be for. Who lives in 1080p still? Must be a horrible place to live. Sorry. OK, so that's about what it's going to look like. OK, so on the right, we have the app that's going to go onto people's phones. Now, there is an app in the App Store already. You can download it by all means. Please do. Please give it five stars, even though we didn't write it. Um, the people who did are good people. They did a really good job. Um, but nonetheless, that's not this one. So if you want to go reverse engineering it, by all means, but you won't get this code yet. Nonetheless, this is the Schoolies app. This is what they'll see. They get a little bit of a backstage menu here. They can go home, what's on, see some news. Um, and then depending on who you logged in as, you can either see a volunteer dashboard or you can get a series of jobs handed to you. So as a volunteer on the ground, um, you know, Schoolie gets drunk, falls down. OK, so their friend calls. And if it's, you know, if they need an ambulance, call an ambulance. But if they don't need an ambulance, they just need someone to walk them home, then they'll probably call frogs or you know, one of the frogs walking around will say, hey, I should probably fish this kid out of the gutter and figure out where they live and do they need help. And so we'll end up with a job in their job list. Um, the team of frogs on the ground will uh, mark the job as accepted, or if they start off their own initiative, then they'll just say, okay, I'm going to do an ad hoc job here. And then off we go and do some stuff, and at the end of it, we mark the job as done, and then we're back available to have other jobs assigned to us. So it's a really simple distributed task allocation <coughs> system. As far as this talk is concerned, we don't really care about the subject matter other than to get a quick understanding of what the app does. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So we have a bunch of apps. Likewise, I should probably log in. No, I am logged in. Um, likewise, here we go. I'll just make this guy a little bit bigger. We've got some, here we go, this guy. Pancakes for 75 people because presumably Mr. Cook forgot to order pizza or something along those lines. So this is our dispatch center. So we can create calls. Oh. 1080p really does hurt. There you go. Um, so obviously, call comes in, a call center person can add a call that appears as a job, and then our dispatchers start looking at well, who's available, which jobs are available, and where are my team members on the ground. Sensible? How would you build this? Just the dispatch application to start with. How would you actually build this? What technologies would you start thinking about? Everyone's very quiet. 
Frankly, look back in. Either. <clears throat> Perhaps a bit of bootstrap and angular. Okay, so bootstrap and angular for the front end. Okay, what about back end? What are some people's tools of choice? Entity framework. Okay, entity framework. Yep. What else? It's a very quiet room this evening. You guys are a tough crowd. MongoDB. <laughs> because it's web scale? I don't know, what kind of database would you use? Okay. Um, for this one, we're actually just using Entity Framework. Um, it, there's no real value in using Mongo, plus I kind of like my writes to be like atomic and reliable. Um, <laughs> and that's a running joke about Mongo at the moment. Um, but yeah, so in this case, this one is pretty much uh, front end, it's Bootstrap, it's AngularJS, and that's about all. Um, and then in the back end, we're using, again, it's the same Nancy FX API, so it's standard HTTP API with Nancy, Entity Framework, and a bunch of other things that, for the purposes of this talk, we don't really care about all that much. Other than to note that this app makes things appear in this app, which goes on the phone. Right. So we can see, actually, let's just quickly make this big. And I'm going to flick back to the phone. I'm going to go to my jobs, and I'm logged in as me, and we can see that I've got a job here called Pancakes for 75 people, and that corresponds to the job in the dispatch window over there. Now, I'm going to cancel that assignment. Oops, did I actually? There we go. I wonder how much of my cloud has fallen down because I'm on LTE. Anyway, we'll find out. Yeah, no, it looks like my cloud's fallen down because I'm on LTE. Oh, no, there we go. That's interesting. This one's not updated. This will update in a minute. But regardless, my job list over here is updated, so that's been pushed to the phone. Likewise, I'm then going to assign the actual... I'll assign it to another team. Reassign it there. OK. And that's still not going to appear on my job list. So what we care about at this point is this is an app that's on people's phones. We need to send jobs to it. We need to get data back from them. And we need to also be able to have schoolies request assistance. So things like, as a schoolie, Hi, I'm drunk and lost, and could you please come on, like, send someone to walk me home? Or, hey, uh, we budgeted for the hotel, and we budgeted, this happens, right? We budgeted for the hotel, we budgeted for alcohol, and we totally forgot about this whole food thing. So, uh, <laughs> you laugh, but it happens. It happens, it happens a lot. Um, we've got a couple of actual schoolies volunteers who are out on the ground in the room with us, and yes, they'll tell you stories as, as far as the privacy legislation allows. Um, but nonetheless, so people will phone up and say, hey, uh, totally forgot that like mum wasn't going to be here to like um, make, make dinner. Um, can you like give us food? And so the frogs will turn up and pancakes or whatever. Basically anything they can do to prevent the schoolies from just drinking all their vodka in one go and then falling down in the gutter. Anyway, so let's have a look at what's actually going on. How does this app look? And there we go. So this is a fairly vanilla looking AngularJS app. Who's seen an Angular app before? Yes, okay, good. As in the innards of one, not the, yeah, okay, good. All right, so fairly vanilla looking Angular app. It's not particularly interesting from that perspective. Um, the one thing I'll note though is we're serving these from localhost. So this guy's on localhost 1008, sorry, 11080. And this guy is on localhost 12080, because made up numbers, why not? OK, so how's that happening? Um, note one other thing as well. I asked earlier, who, wrote, who writes nicely factored JavaScript apps? Who actually extracts their different either classes, modules, functions, whatever, you know, component of JavaScriptiness into different files? All right. Who then includes them all by hand into index.html? Please tell me who's done that. OK, who uses something like um, the MVC like bundling? OK, how well does that go for a mobile app? When you actually have to like, put it onto a device and you don't have a web server to do the dynamic generation of index.html? Really right. well. <laughs> really well. It's so exciting, because what you end up doing is you crack open basically every single JavaScript file you create, you crack open index.html, and you add a reference to that JavaScript file. Okay. And you don't ever forget one, and you don't ever want to change one's name, and you don't forget that, or well, sometimes you may change just the casing of the file, and no one's ever noticed. And of course, you know, forgetting, like, well, sorry, if you delete a JavaScript file, then you get a 404. 
But if you just forget to add one, you don't get any error right up until your code crashes, which is really convenient. Okay. So it might be nice to you know, not have to worry about that kind of thing. So let's have a look. I think this is going to dump me back to PowerPoint if I do that. It is. Ah, oh, you horrible thing. There we are. Ah, go away. Right. Okay, there we are. So app structure is fairly straightforward. We've, we've used a uh, directory per feature. Um, all we really care about is this guy, which is index.html. That's it. There's a bunch of inline JavaScripts, notably lines 10 through 13. Uh, I would say a cookie or a lolly for someone who can tell me what that is, but I don't have one. So I'll give a cookie or a virtual lolly to someone who can tell me where that code's from. It's the instrumentation from New Relic. It is instrumentation from New Relic. Well done, sir. Maybe that gave it away a little bit. OK. Um, <laughs> just maybe that one over there? Oh, who knows? OK. Um, and yes, you can see my license key. If you really, really must beat up a charity organization, then go ahead. You can spam logs to it as well. But you can get exactly the same thing just by going to anybody else's like, landing page and viewing source. You're not going to win anything there. Um, so apart from our instrumentation code, um, we've got some Google APIs. Uh, that's because Google Maps are a little bit sensitive about when they get loaded, so it's a whole lot easier to just load them first page load. Other than that, What's all this? What's all this? All right, so what we end up with is if we're serving the same index.html page, let's view source. OK, um, ignore the fact that the New Relic code is actually gigantic and just in Visual Studio, it doesn't wrap, but it goes a long way to the right. So ignore the fact that this gigantic blob of JavaScript is New Relic instrumentation. Who wants to put all of these script and CSS references in by hand? Should I keep scrolling? Should I keep scrolling? Is anyone bored yet? All right. Let's not do that. You'll notice some magic script at the bottom that didn't exist in the other one as well. So let's not do that. Let's be sensible about this. What tool am I going to show you next? I really should have brought lollies. Gulp. Gulp. Well done. Sweet. Two for you. Hit me up afterwards. I'll have to actually give you a lolly. OK, so going to have a look at Gulp. What's Gulp? Gulp is a JavaScript build tool. Who's ever used Make? You know, like old Unix Make from like forever ago? OK, Gulp is like Make on steroids. It's like Make, but nice. It's not like MS Build, because it's nice. Um, so what Gulp does is it allows us to take the JavaScript that we've written and convert that into the JavaScript that's going to run. Okay. And that means that we can do all sorts of really nice things, like have uh, relative paths that actually make sense, or references in our styles to fonts without having to go dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash fonts and hope that we get the right number of parent directories, and then get told off by a web server who thinks that you're still like an old school code red attack or something like that. Um, so we want to be able to take the JavaScript that we've written, munge it in some way, process it in some way, and then spit out JavaScript that will run. That means that it's actually quite easy to structure a JavaScript application so that it makes sense to a human, but then spit it out in a way that makes sense to a browser. So now, this one we're looking at, this code, I'm just going to maximize this for a second. So this code that we're looking at has all of these things in it. That's the development version. Um, this is generally what we'd play with unless there's a reason not to. Um, it's easier to debug because you can use your normal browser debugging tools and all that sort of stuff. Um, this one, though, looks same, same. Oops, except I haven't logged into this one. And forgive the styling, that bit's not done yet. But if I view source on this one, we see the same new relic code. And now what do we see? What are our script includes? If I make it bigger so that people don't squint at me, what are our script includes? We've got basically just our vendor-supplied libraries, so things like, in this case, um, Ionic Framework, which includes AngularJS, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, we've got Moment.js. We've got a whole bunch of other thing.js you know, buzzwords that you may, may or may not have heard of. They're all compiled into a vendor.js stuff. Basically, this is all of the stuff that we need for our app. This, these are the libraries. Okay? You can use Bower to install these. We're not going to touch on Bower tonight. Um, you can use a whole bunch of different ways, you can, um, or you can just cherry-pick them by hand. 
The next one is our app. I'm going to open that. And you can see we've actually got our code. Question. Uh, could you um, also use source maps? You could use source maps. Um, there are some places where source maps don't work particularly well. Um, a lot of the, uh, the gulp tooling, for instance, uh, isn't source map aware yet. Um, things like the uh, gulp rev plugin, the one that actually adds the revision, which changes the file name, wasn't source map aware until like six, eight weeks ago, something like that. Okay. So yeah, and there are still some irritating ways that you have to serve the source maps without actually making them available to the public. So, but yes, you can. But basically what we're looking at here is our JavaScript code. Now in this case, it's been concatenated and minified a little bit, but not minified to any extreme extent, and it's not been mangled. Right? It's not actually been obfuscated in any way. We've still got normal variable names, we've still got a bunch of other stuff. We'll change that in a minute. Okay. So what we want to do, though, is we want to be able to go from the JavaScript that we write to the JavaScript that the browser is going to, be, going to get given, and the way we're going to do that is using Gulp. So if we look at our tool chain here, what we're going to start with is, now you can use your editor of choice here, so if you're, who's comfortable in Visual Studio, who likes WebStorm, who uses Vim, what, Sublime, right. the thing is, don't care. Okay, you can use whatever editor you're comfortable in. You're just editing text files. We tend to forget that a little bit. Um, we're going to have a really quick look at Node.js and basically just enough to get us up and running with Gulp. And then we're going to have a look at Gulp because Gulp is what we care about. So how am I actually serving these? Now, we would have noticed a little bit earlier that this is running off localhost 10081. I'm just going to go back to 10080. Not that it really matters, but that's the one that I signed into. Okay, so we're actually running this from Gulp. And Gulp is running on command line, and it looks a bit like this. Okay, so this is the mobile app. So all I do is I type gulp watch. Okay, we'll come back to gulp magic in a minute. Don't worry about the font, it's tiny and you don't need to read it. I type gulp watch, the screen spams a whole bunch of stuff, and then at the end of that, something went wrong. I know something went wrong. I just took your script out from underneath you. There we are. Here we are, our app is there. Now, I'm going to change something in the app, and given that we're running, uh, where are we? Welcome to the Red Frogs app. Come on, go left. Yeah, that's not what I wanted. There we are. Okay, so welcome to the Red Frogs app, and on the right we can see the red, so I'm just going to say, welcome to the Brisbane.net user group. Save. Boom. So what's just happened? Magic. Magic. <laughs> I have an assistant in the back room who just sacrificed a goat for me and did stuff. OK, so what's actually happened there? So I've made a code change. Now remember, these files are not the files on disk that the browser is pointing at. The browser is pointing at, at some web server somewhere. Okay? Um, and the key is, uh, one of the things that Gulp is doing for us is running a local web server. Now, Gulp is not a web server. It's just a tool that allows you to do a whole bunch of things. One of those things happens to be run a web server. That's kind of a minor point. But what it allows us to do is make a quick change on disk and then immediately see the results reflected in the browser. So let's actually have a look at what on earth is going on here, because this is important. So make big gulpfile.js for this guy and go away you. OK. Now, we're not going to go through an entire gulp file. But, whoops, that's the wrong one. Gulp file, mobile app one, this guy. Here we are. Oh, no, OK. Busted, I copied and pasted code. Busted, I'm a bad person. I should be, like, crucified. OK, so this is gulp. Um, the only things you really care about, as far as gulp is concerned, is that you define a gulp task by going task, and you give it the task name in quotes, and then you give it optionally a collection of task dependencies. So in the same way as you have a Unix make, so you might have a make build, which depends on a make clean, or you might have just a you know, make, or then, sorry, make configure, and then actually make or make install. The whole point is that you can just set up your dependencies by saying this step depends on that step, and then does this thing. So when we typed gulp watch earlier, 
Whoops, where are we? When we typed Gulp Watch here, Gulp Watch has basically said, okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna launch a live, relays, live reload server. We'll come back to that, but that's basically how our browser knows to refresh magically. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna watch for the source directory to be changed. We're also gonna watch for any index.html stuff to be changed. And on change, we're gonna log it as well as actually go and do it, yeah, go and do a task. Um, when something changes, we're just gonna run a default build task again. And what that's gonna result in is, if I open this guy in Windows Explorer, where are we? that guy. Sorry, it's all very confusing on many fewer pixels. Okay, so we have our source tree, source. We also have a sample test in there that I'll show you in a minute. And then we have a dist folder. This is what's gonna be distributed. And inside dist, we have, don't worry if you can't see the fonts, we have a dev folder and a min folder. Who can guess what's in there? The dev code and minified code. One we serve from the 80 port number, one we serve from the 81 port number. Why? Because this one's a whole lot easier to poke around in. So you can see inside our JS, we've got a whole bunch of stuff. There we are, all of our JS files. In here, min, that's it. We've got some images, which are useful. We've got some CSS stuff, which is useful. But everything else is here. And it's all just minified and uglified and magic's done. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Now, all we've done at this point is we've built a web app. whoop de doo who hasn't built a web app before? Okay. How do we actually get this onto a device? Why do we care? So the reason that we're using Gulp for this, or Angular Gulp, all the rest of it, is because what we're going to end up with is a single page application that we can then bundle up inside of a phone gap or a Cordova container of some sort and bung it straight onto a mobile device. Um, now that's quite useful, but how on earth do we actually do that? Who's used tooling to do that before? Who's actually used phone gap to put something on a device? One, two, three, four, five, some. What was your tooling of choice? Phone gap, actually, the, the Adobe phone gap? Yeah, okay. Is anybody a photographer? Does anybody have a Creative Cloud subscription? Did you know that you actually get phone gap billed for free as part of your Creative Cloud subscription? Ooh, that's interesting. I see some light bulbs. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this single page application, we're going to bung it into a Cordova container, and then PhoneGap is going to somehow magically just make us an app that we can distribute to either iOS or Android or Windows Phone, if you know anybody who has one. Um, that's not fair. I know two people, and they're both... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, at this point, what we have is... Forgetting about the application structure, we have a reasonably nicely factored application and it's reasonably nicely bundleable. So I'm going to do that. Now, we'll have a really quick look at Gulp again when we come to some of the testing stuff, but can I do this? Will this work? Hey, was, is that a web socket? How does the browser know that it had changed on the server? Okay, so the, the way that the browser knew that it had changed on the server, um, Actually, I might skip that one for now. Uh, it's called Live Reload. Just Google Live Reload. Um, there are lots of HTTP listeners floating around the place. Um, there's one to serve each version of the site. Uh, optionally, you can use a different one to serve source maps. There's one for Live Reload. There's one for WebDriver. You've got lots of web servers that end up getting spun up. So I might not muddy the waters just yet. But yeah, Live Reload is the magic tool. OK. So. Who's written a test for JavaScript? That's going to be a smaller group of people, surely. OK, now, fess up, let's be honest. Without the headers being test frameworks, test runners, UI automation, and so on, who could actually tell me what each of these buzzwords does? One, two, maybe. Yeah. OK, so I'm not going to go through how to actually write JavaScript tests. I'll show you a couple of placeholder ones, but that's about all. Um, but basically, the way you actually write your tests, as in when you write code, so you're going to write a .js file, and it's usually going to be called something or other .spec.js, um, that's going to be written in uh, probably Jasmine. Jasmine seems to be the front runner at the moment. It seems to have been the front runner for a while. QUnit was a thing. 
it's pretty verbose and people are starting to get irritated with it. Um, Mocha is nice, but it tends to be the hipster crowd at the moment. Um, that may well change. But basically, uh, Mocha and Jasmine share very similar syntax. Um, Q unit's quite different. But basically, that's your equivalent of, you know, public void test food method, whatever. Okay, so when we're actually talking about test syntax, we care about the first three. Now that's all very nice, but how do we actually run them? Okay, so running them is where the test frameworks come in. Um, who can pronounce the first one for me? Hutzpah. All right, Hutzpah. Okay, Hutzpah. All right, and I really, really should have brought lolly, should have brought lollies for people for that one, and I didn't. So Hutzpah and Karma are test runners. Uh, we're going to have a quick look at Karma, a very quick look at Karma. Again, I'm not teaching you how to use these things. I'm teaching you where they sit in your tool chain. Okay, ReSharper will actually run JavaScript tests. Who knew that? Okay, it will actually do it. It's not great at it. Um, it doesn't support the like the async module loading that you need to pull in all of your Angular modules and Angular mocks and those sorts of things. You can do it, but it makes your tests really ugly. But it it is actually really nice if you just write a Jasmine JavaScript test and then just point ReSharper at it and say run all the tests. It will do it. So if you're testing a simple thing, ReSharper is your friend. Okay, and finally, everyone's heard of Protractor, but nobody actually knew what it is. Um, Protractor is effectively a JavaScript interface into WebDriver. Who's played with Selenium? Okay, so Protractor, Selenium, same, same. Both talk to WebDriver. They both do UI, UI automation. Now, the key is that running JavaScript requires some kind of JavaScript interpreter or compiler or runtime environment of some sort, and pretty much everyone uses a browser for this. So. Your test runners, uh, for the most part, will either spin up Chrome, or the easiest way to do it is to spin up PhantomJS, which is a headless browser which doesn't actually flash up on the screen. Um, if you're using Chrome, it gets really, really irritating because every time you run your test, it launches a browser and it flashes up and it goes away and it gets really confusing. And it's yet another HTTP listener. Okay, so we'll have a really, really quick look at how they sit. And I'm just going to look. Actually, that guy will do. Login controller. So. This is how a Jasmine test looks. Okay. Preferably with not to do implement me <laughs> inside it. Okay. So when we say we're so we're describing a particular thing. So this is our login. This is we're testing our login controller, login controller.spec.js. And we say so we're testing enabling and disabling the login button. And login button is disabled when the email address is not. Right? You haven't told us who you are. No, you can't hit the login button. Right. Likewise, when you haven't typed a password, no, you can't hit login. Okay, and this is a really easy way of using Angular to just grey out UI uh, UI elements before they're allowed to be used. Okay, and likewise, when someone's typed both an email address and a password, then they can hit the login button, and then it's actually going to go off and do some sort of API call to see if they're allowed in. Does that make sense? Okay, so if I run this, and I'm just whoa, I've lost some screen here. Run unit tests. Oh, that's why. There we go. Resharper will actually do that for me, and I've filtered out failing tests. There we go. So there we are. That's how it looks in Resharper. It's exactly the same as your N unit runner or your MS test runner or your X unit runner or whatever else. It fits in there really nicely. It also hooks in really nicely to Team City, which we'll come to in a minute. So at this point, we've built a web app. What do you do? But it's a well-tested web app, which is better. Okay. And now we want to ship it somewhere. And it doesn't really matter where somewhere is, whether it's going to be a CI environment or a nightly demo environment or a you know let the salespeople show potential customers to it environment or whatever it is, or we're actually going to ship it to production. Um, we need to change some things. Notably, we're going to need to change some connection strings. Now, you remember when I hit F5? It launched the little IE, like it launched the browser and all the rest of it, pointing at the API placeholder page. Okay, um, and all that's going to do is sit there and handle API requests for us. That's nice, but we've got to point our app somewhere else. So, let's have a look at how we know where to point it in the first place. So, there's a list of stuff to Google at the end of this, by the way. So don't worry about config.js in a mobile app. There we go. So. This is an Angular module. Um, we have a 
encapsulated here, self-executing function. We've defined an Angular module called red frogs, and we're going to just register some values. Thank you. Who's seen Angular's dependency injection before? Yeah? OK, so you know that I can just take a dependency on a client version or on an API endpoint setting. Yeah. So if I do something like job service in that guy, and you can see that my job service factory takes a dependency on, amongst other things, an API endpoint setting, which means when it wants to know, hey, what jobs have I, it just says API endpoint setting plus and then whatever my known API path is. Does that make sense? And that's really cool, but it points to localhost all the time, which is not so great when localhost happens to be a phone in someone's pocket that's not running my API web server. How do I change this? We could do something like, again, comment out. <laughs> Dear God, please don't let me forget to uncomment this. All right, and that's going to be really, really silly. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to rely on the rest of our build pipeline to do some of these transformations for us. So as far as our code is concerned, it's always just going to consume that API endpoint setting or the you know, toggle particular feature on or off setting or whatever it happens to be. Incidentally, this is just me being really, really lazy so that I can copy, paste, and reorder things around here without having to either add the semicolon at the end or not. Uh, <laughs> because JS Lent has an absolute hissy fit if you don't if you have like the trailing comma. So um, so what we're going to do is we're going to change the API endpoint setting, but how are we going to do that? So let's have a look at I'm going to leave that as an open question for now. Okay. But what we're going to look at next is how we actually package this thing up, because that's what everyone's here to see. Right. So we've got a web app. OK, we've established that. Move on. So let's move on. We want this folder, just slash min, in a Cordova container. Let's do that. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use, in this case, Telerik App Builder. Now, I don't particularly care which one you choose. Um, there are a bunch of variations on the theme of Cordova because it's open source. Um, PhoneYap is Adobe's proprietary fork of Cordova. They may um, contribute back to it. I don't know if they, you know, once upon a time they did. Um, but basically, all you need is something that will take a bunch of HTML and JavaScript in a zip file or whatever format and bundle it into an actual app container. So in this case, we've used App Builder. Whoops. And App Builder is really nice. You can go file a new project and have an app up and running in about two, three minutes. I think at DDD Brisbane, we had one actually up and on a phone in about nine minutes beginning to end or something like that. Anyway. Um, but in this case, we get our app identifier. We've got a whole bunch of iOS, Android, and Windows phone specific settings, so things like what do the icons look like? What do the splash screens look like? And so on. And they're different for each platform. So you get to customize those and do your thing. Okay. And normally what happens is inside your App Builder project, I'll close this to a reason, you put your source code. Whoops, not that. Go away. So inside here, you would put an index.html, and then you would put your source directory or whatever, and you've had all of your JavaScript. And that's really cool, except which principle are we violating? Bingo. The code you write is not the code you run. Okay? You write the code, and then you transpile it. You use your Gulp pipeline to avoid making all of the stupid human, I forgot to do things mistakes. Okay? So that doesn't work particularly well. So what, what we're going to do in this case is we're actually going to use App Builder purely as a build tool. And the way we do that is using one of our other favorite build tools, which is Octopus Deploy. So we're going to pack this guy. Now, this guy's got a new spec file. And notably, all we're going to do is we are going to pack dist slash min out of the previously built app. Okay. So our mobile app is built using gulp. And then this guy just picks up the gulp output and drops it into a NuGet package. That's all at this stage. Likewise, we're also going to save this from a web server, because you know, if you actually have a, who has a BlackBerry, anybody? <laughs> Someone's going to have a BlackBerry. Okay. <laughs> so one, if you have a unsupported mobile platform, it's really useful to have exactly the same code served from a web server. Two, it's also a really easy way to get very fast feedback 
from people because they don't have to do all of their mobile app updates. Even though like App Builder and PhoneGap do a over-the-air update, uh, I think PhoneGap calls it streaming or hydration. Sorry, um, App Builder. I don't know what it's called, but you poke it with three fingers and the new version comes down. But you can just hit refresh in a browser. Okay. So we want to be able to serve this from both a web server and via an app container. So this is our new spec file for the app container, and this guy is the new spec file for the web server version. And they look suspiciously similar, except that the other guy doesn't have a deploy.ps1. OK. So at this point, we've pretty much done everything code-wise that we need to care about. Okay. So let's start having a look at our build pipeline. OK. And who wants to bet that at the end of this talk, I forget to spin my Azure instances down and get a whacking great build this month? <laughs> <laughs> Will someone please remind me? OK, so I'm going to launch, oops, where are we? I'm going to launch one of these and launch that. OK, and here comes everything. I'm going to close the Slack and a few other bits and pieces because there's no sweariness on there, but I did snark a little bit about a few things that Azure was and wasn't doing. OK, so let's have a look at our build pipeline. I'm going to skip that one. So our build pipeline, we're going to do a git push in GitHub. It's going to go to Team City. Who's not used Team City? Anyone? Anyone? OK, cool. Have a look at Team City. But basically, insert your build tool of choice. It doesn't matter. Likewise, um, Octopus. Octopus is wonderful. If you don't have it or something like it, you should get it. But since nobody put their hand up and fessed up to just copying and pasting stuff onto a web server, so I'm going to assume that everyone has at least something in this space, we're going to feed it to our builder. And at the end of this, we are going to get an IPA file, which is an IOS. So let's actually do this, and then let's watch what happens. So um, where's my shrink a bit commander? And I'm just going to have a really quick look. Git status. I think I have a resharper. Oh, we've got our welcome. Actually, welcome will do. OK. And I don't care about that one. All right. You may laugh at me for using tortoise git if you wish, but it's actually quite useful. So I'm going to commit that. Um, to... All right, so that's our welcome change that we did earlier. Okay. So let's commit that. And then I'm going to do a git push. You'll notice I'm doing a git, a YOLO push straight to master. Um, probably wouldn't do that if you were being really responsible. Lucky this isn't in production yet. <laughs> but yeah, so we've just done a YOLO push directly to, uh, to master. Now let's have a look at what's actually going to happen here. Right. You'll notice a bunch of builds failing as well. I'll come back to why that was in a minute. But what should happen is we've just pushed it to GitHub. Uh, there we go. Um, GitHub has sent a post to Team City saying, hey, you've got some changes. You should like, do something. Team City's then going to pick this up and build it. And that's all very nice. What's Team City actually going to do? So let's have a look. Come on, I build. Where are you? There we are. Hooray. OK, so Team City is going to do a bunch of things. Now I'm going to open the configuration for this build. It takes about six minutes beginning to end. So that's how long I have to walk you through it. Let's see if we can keep up with it. So these are the build steps for. Team City. The very first thing it does is it's going to run Gulp on the dispatch application. So this is the call center and all of the, um, the task coordination stuff. So it's going to run Gulp on that, and it's going to spit out a dist slash min folder. The next thing it's going to do is it's going to run Gulp. And remember, this is Gulp default, which is what we had a quick look at earlier, uh, on the mobile app, which is going to spit out a dist slash min folder. Uh, then it's going to run Karma. We'll come back to Karma if we have time, but I'm aware that we're a little bit short on it. But basically, it's running our unit tests, and that's quite nice because tests are good. The next thing it's doing is it's using the new spec files, the, one that, the ones that go dot dot slash dist slash min, to say, hey, I want you to take this minified, uglified output from over here, and I want you to drop it into a package for me. And it's actually dropping those into a NuGet package, which is then going to push to Octopus. Now we're in familiar territory. We're compiling our C-sharp code. We haven't even looked at any C-sharp code. Who wants to look at C-sharp code tonight? Anyone? Does anybody care? 
It's C sharp code. It does an API. It works. It's good. Fine. Um, except that, you know, C sharp code also has tests, right? Yeah. Right, everyone. Yeah. Good. Okay. So it'll compile our code. It'll test our code. So now we've tested our client side app. We've tested our server side app. Um, presumably, presumably everything is good, which means at this point we've published everything to Octopus. Now we're going to create a release and we're going to deploy a release. So let's see how we're going. We are on step six of nine, so we're getting there. We're just running in unit. Okay, so the interesting thing is about to start happening. What we're going to do is we're going to rely on Octopus's configuration transforms to actually replace some of our JavaScript for us. Okay. Now I'm going to show you my Octopus variables, and you're going to try very faithfully to copy the connection strings. You're also then going to try to sneak them off the video later, but hopefully they will be marked as secure in Octopus. But if not, well, this could be embarrassing. Um, so what's happening at the moment is we've just picked up all of this stuff. Here we are. Push it to Octopus. Oops, we're not quite there yet. There we are. We're pushing the last package to Octopus now. So what will happen as soon as we hit step eight is the Octopus dashboard should light up and it should start doing some stuff for us. Um, now, one of the things that it's going to do is it's going to pull down that NuGet package. So it's going to pull down the normal API package and deploy it as just a normal website, nobody cares. Uh, it's going to pull down the Windows service NuGet package, and it's going to deploy that onto a couple of workers. Here we go, we've started. It's also going to pull down the mobile app package onto a central Octopus server, which we're just using as a cloud agent, and then it's going to run some Node. Specifically, it's going to run the app builder build pipeline. But the party trick is it's actually going to do all of our configuration transforms for us before it then goes and builds the IPA file. Right, if you reach inside an IPA, you know, remember you sign it with a certificate, right? You sign it with a key. Um, if you just reach inside an IPA file and change a whole bunch of config settings, then the hash isn't going to match anymore. Right, so it won't work. So we need to change the configuration settings, then build the IPA file. So what's actually going on here? Come on, Octopus. Where are we? OK, so we're going to grab all of the packages. We're going to build the app builder. Now, these will all run in parallel. Um, so while that's doing its thing, what I'll actually show you is what we've told it to do. So our process, come on, who wants to sneak and pick the variables? Who thinks they can copy the connection strings out? Was I responsible? Yes. Ha. <laughs> OK, so let's have a look at our deployment process. This is why this is kicking off. It usually takes about four minutes. OK, the one that we care about is the very first one. And what that's going to do is very, very simple. The very first step is it's going to replace a bunch of configuration settings. So Octopus gives you the option to replace magic strings inside either, well, basically any file you want. So uh, your web.config or app.config files, your web.release.config, all those sorts of things. So it will, it will apply those transformations, but you can also tell Octopus, look, just replace stuff in these arbitrary files. So we're doing that. We're doing that as the first step in this process. So we've got this config.transforms.js that we haven't looked at yet. That's a bit odd looking. And we're replacing everything in stuff. Now, there is only one batch file, so I haven't been particularly discriminant here, but um, what we actually want to replace it in is that guy. That's what we actually care about. So we've got a batch file here that then kicks off a bunch of node modules that then goes and builds our stuff. And this all sounds really complicated, but it's actually not, because that's it. And at the end of this process, let's see how we're going. We're nearly there. We're waiting on this guy. So what's actually happened is we've taken our dist slash min, our minified JavaScript, we've wrapped it in an app builder bundle. We've actually pushed that up to Telerik's app builder cloud. And as part of this step, we've then told it, okay, could you please build that for me and give me a downloadable IPA file that I can then just use. So that's what's actually going to end up on my iPhone. So that's what we're waiting for at the moment. So let's recap. We've written our JavaScript, we've written our HTML, we've saved it, we've run Gulp, we've played with it locally, just using Gulp Watch and Gulp Serve. Or sorry, um, I can't remember the server, Connect, sorry. Um, we've then committed that to version control. That's gone to Team City. Team City has then built us a NuGet package. Octopus then picks up that NuGet package, splats it onto disk, bundles it up 
for app builder, and then app builder has actually gone and done a cloud-based build. There's a little bit less string and bubble gum here than there used to be. So we're actually looking in fairly good shape here. I'm just waiting for this to finish up. Um, it doesn't help that now is like wake up time for chunks of the United States, so we're probably contending for hardware. But um, what we're looking for though is at the end of this process, we want an IPA file that we can actually download. Okay, we want an IPA file that we can just feed straight into the App Store. Or for production releases, we want an, a an IPA file that we can just automatically, via a script, feed straight to the App Store. You hit deploy to production, boom, it goes into Apple's queue for approval. Okay. Oh, hey, there we go. Um, I probably, I'd be a little bit cautious about doing the last step as a completely automated thing, because if you're doing the proper like continuous delivery thing and you spam Apple with 20 or 30 apps or versions of your app per day to review, Apple tends to hold a grudge. So I probably, and like Apple's really big and we're not, so um, probably try to avoid having them be cranky with you. So, what have we done? Well, at this point, what we have is a downloadable IPA file. And there's our app. It's seven or eight megabytes. All right, <laughs> All right there we go. Now let's crack it open. Let's really quickly crack it open and have a look. So, 7-zip, open archive. It is just a zip file. There we go. And... Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's going to be in templates. This guy. And let's see if we can find our magic text. Whoops. There we go. There's our IPA file with the text that we text change that we've just made. Okay. Now that's hard, but it doesn't need to be hard any longer. Okay, it's not that tricky. The magic trick that I'll show you around the uh, configuration transformation, really quickly. So we've had a look at the first step in the process, which is the app builder process here where we're telling it to, oops, to replace everything in source slash config transforms.js. So let's now have a look back at our sneaky trick. This is almost the only dirty trick that we've actually used, and it's not particularly dirty, but it's a little bit sneaky. So there we are, that will do. Okay, so in our application here, remember we had our config.js? Everyone remembers these? Yep, okay, so these are our variables, um, and they are actual development variables. This will work. We know that because we've just run it. Okay, but this one is a little bit ugly. Now, this is what we want as far as replacements concerned, but obviously, if we try to just run this locally, then, well, we can't really connect to hash brace API endpoint. Okay, it's not a valid HTTP base URL. So, what we're doing is we are asking Octopus to replace these tokens with Octopus variables. And then we're just overriding config.js with config.transforms.js. It's really, really simple. It's a little bit dirty trick, but I'm OK with that because it makes everything else really, really simple. Um, so at this point, we've got Octopus replacing those tokens. Once those tokens are replaced, we just override our config file. And then our app is just normal. As far as our app is concerned, it's just got a reference to config.js, which we will see. Whoops, not there. So um, the batch file is a bunch of calls to the app builder node stuff. I will come, th come to that in a second, because um, node's a little bit of an ugly beast, and you can tie yourself into knots with it quite quickly. Right. But what we're doing at this point, though, is we're just dropping all of these configs straight into the JavaScript. So as far as the app is concerned, it's just always been that way. Okay. The app doesn't know that it's got dynamically sourced configuration. It doesn't care. But it also means that, so let's have a look at our API endpoint variable, for instance. So if I go back to variables, all right, so where am I? API endpoint. So that's our CI one. That's our live one. You can hit them both <laughs> if you really want. They theoretically shouldn't do anything unless you have a valid authentication token. Um, so if you man manage to get them to do anything without a valid authentication token, I really wouldn't mind hearing about it. 
please. Uh, <laughs> but regardless, so whichever environment we're deploying into, Octopus will do the config transforms for us, and then we just get a downloadable IPA bundle with those configuration files in there. Okay. So the last piece of magic is the actual, whoops. Ah, oh, that's right. There is a trick in this one, which is that App Builder will throw a raging hissy fit if you actually include a .bat file in the project, because it rightly says I have no way of knowing how to deal with that. So don't include it. You can see that it's just great out there. So what we're doing under the covers is just this. We're calling a bunch of node modules. And the node modules on Windows are wrapped in .command, .cmd wrappers, so basically batch files. It's a whole lot easier to call these from a DOS batch file than it is from PowerShell. Don't do it to yourself. You can do it, but you just have to escape the universe. So, whereas if you shell out to a batch file, it just works. Okay. So, what we're doing here is we're saying to App Builder, so we're calling App Builder's, so this App Builder is a node module. We're calling App Builder prop set, so this is property setter. Um, and then we're just telling it the app identifier. Okay. So we'll have a quick look at the Telerik console in a second, but basically we're setting the app identifier, we're setting the project name, the display name, everything that we want it to build for this particular bundle. Um, and then the last thing we do on line 12 is we say call app builder build iOS. Okay. If you want to add another line, call app builder build Android. Call app builder build Windows Phone. We give it a certificate. Now, you don't actually put the certificate here. You put the certificate's thumbprint. Um, so your certificate needs to be stored within App Builder. We'll come to that. Likewise, the provisioning profile that we care about. And we want to download. Save it to, whoops. Let's highlight that. Download, save it to. App bundle ID dash octopus release number. The very next thing we do is we then grab that and we pull it back into an octopus artifact, which is this guy. Did anybody know about the new octopus artifact command? Does anybody know that octopus has a bunch of um, PowerShell command bots? Yeah. They're really quite useful. I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what that's going to do is it's going to say, I want you to pick up a particular file name and I want you to create an artifact for me out of it, which come on, puts it here. Job done. We push that to production, we get the production app ID instead. So that makes it really, really simple to go from a code change. Now, remember, at any point, if our build fails, these bundles don't go out the door. Okay, these bundles don't even get built if our tests fail. Okay. So at any point, we can just say, what's the latest code that we want to push to production? I'll have a bundle with that, with those configs in it, please. Five minutes later, we've got our app bundle. Off we go. Question? We didn't specify that Octopus scope. Feels like live in your CI, two different API endpoints in there. Yeah, so basically, uh, whichever uh, Octopus environment you're deploying to. So in this case, I've only got a CI and a live environment, uh, but you can add as many Octopus environments as you want. So then you just scope your variables to that particular Octopus environment. So in this case, we've only got two, all things volatile, all things serious. Don't play in here, do what you want in here. And where in your mm -hmm. code is it sending it to either of those two? So as in the... Uh, where was it deciding which Octopus yeah. environment it was going to? Ah, oh, okay, I see. Right, now I end the question. I understand the question. So, in our Team City build sequence, the very last step is we're going to. So, the second last step is create a release. So, what we do there is we say, dear Octopus, um, here's a bunch of NuGet packages. Okay. Um, could we please have a release, which is basically just an, Octop an Octopus version number? And then, second to that is. Here we are. Please deploy this project name. You can this uh, this is grayed out because it's templated, because we do a lot of these build definitions. Um, so please deploy that particular project name with current build number to the CI environment, which is then this guy, which then <coughs> excuse me, which then has its own set of variables. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is going. But so the last thing that I, I wanted to cover was no. 
because we've kind of glossed over Node and everyone's a little bit scared of Node because it's like, you know, hip and cool and a little bit weird and it's actually really weird when you dig into it a bit. Um, so I'm going to show you a folder structure. I'm going to do it like this. Actually, these ones aren't that bad. I'm going to grab... So this is my node modules folder. <laughs> it gets better. Oh, and it has a reference to PhantomJS, obviously, because we're using it to run tests. Uh, hang on a minute. Wait on. That's, that's, that's... Oh, hang on a minute. That's not fun. Oh, hang on a minute. No, this is getting a bit silly. Um, and we've got a few more. Oh, hang on. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Right. It's nodes all the way down. OK, node modules all the way to the bottom of the jar. Now, I left this to last because it would get a little bit of a chuckle, but it's also, I guess, a bit of a serious point. So the way we end up, I'll, uh, I'll do this really quickly in another command shell. Where are we? This guy. Um, slash temp. Vector, whoops. Vector foo. OK, and cd foo. OK, and I'm going to go npm install. <laughs> I'm going to do this locally. I'm going to install npm install and just install gulp. Can I make that font bigger? Ooh, that's not what I wanted. That's a URL for tonight's talk. Uh, can I make it fast really quick? No, I can't. OK, never mind. Ooh, there we are. OK, so npm install gulp. Now, if you want to get up and running with gulp, npm install gulp. Okay. The next thing that you can do is, and you can install yeah, gulp and gulp, what, what's, I don't know, pick a random gulp module. I don't know. Serve, gulp inject. Pretty much all of your gulp modules you can install like that. I wouldn't. Um, what you can do is you can use a package.json file and then just tell gulp, hey, you should install all of your dependencies. Okay. So basically, you run gulp install, and then gulp install just says, well, hang on a minute. I'm Gulp, and I can bootstrap everything else. Okay. Likewise, if you want App Builder, it's npm install App Builder. Okay. It really is that simple. You download the node installer, npm install thing name. Thing name will probably appear. Okay. On your build server, ooh, npm install dash g App Builder. Bonus marks for who can tell me what dash g means. Global. Who can tell me what global means as far as Node is concerned? Not global. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and there's a gotcha here. So, when you're setting up your build agent on either Team City or Jenkins or you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, when you do an npm install dash g, that means global for all of the applications within your user context. Okay only within your user context. So that means if you're running a build agent, you need to install all of this stuff under the same user context as you're going to run the build agent. And Node on Windows doesn't particularly like running as local system. It kind of does, but it gets confused about where its home directory is. So it'll install stuff into one place, and then it goes and looks for the modules in another place. So that'll save you probably about four hours of your life, which I would like back. <clears throat> Anyway, so npm install dash g app builder stuff. Like, actually, I'm not going to do that because that's going to come over an LTE connection and that will cost me the rest of my house. Um, that's going to install a node module which has dependencies on other node modules, which has dependencies on other node modules, which sounds suspiciously like NuGet, except that NuGet is sensible and puts all of the packages at the top level of the hierarchy and just adds a version suffix. Node, well, NPM, the Node Package Manager, just goes, well, you needed a thing, so I got you a copy of the thing. Okay? And pretty much everyone needs a copy of certain packages. Like, almost everyone needs a copy of Dell or RimRaf or whatever the actual package name is, which means you end up with, like, 30, 50, 200 copies of the same code, some of which may be the same version, some of which may not be. Okay. To the rescue... No, so it's flattened flat packages now. Right. It's flattened packages, except that it doesn't always work. 
Because what it does is it goes and looks through all of your node modules, and it goes and looks at your package and your JSON and a bunch of other files, and it says, well, this thing kind of needs the same thing as that thing. So I'll just shift them all up to the top level hierarchy, and then I'll rewrite everything that I know about to rewrite, except that some packages don't follow the same conventions as other packages. And so what you end up with is a flattened node modules folder um, and a broken gulp install. So don't do it that way. The other thing you can do is you can say, well, this non node modules file folder is gigantic. I mean, we're looking at where it was. How do you get rid of magnifier? Here, go away. Go away. So we're looking at PhantomJS now, th th and that's going to have, again, a whole bunch of node modules all the way down, and that's all very boring. Um, we could just say, well, maybe we should just install these modules when we actually do our build, because the only reason we need them is for gulp. We're not actually writing stuff in Node at this point. That's a completely separate talk. We're just using Node because that's what Gulp is written in. That's what a bunch of other stuff is written in, but that's all we care about. So all we really need to do is find a way to make Gulp work. And we can do that by just doing npm install Gulp and then npm install all the dependencies at build time. Is that a good idea? I think we'll I'm going to start a religious war here, and then I'm going to go away. Check in your NuGet packages. Check in your node modules. Okay. Wow. I'm not hearing any rotten fruit coming this way just yet. OK. I should be able to git clone, get on a plane, and still work on my code. Okay. I want to be able to run Gulp Watch without any cloud connectivity, without any magic. I want to just be able to get the code and run the code. That's what I should be able to do. Um, who, who's heard of Grunt? Grunt? Anybody used it? Was anybody using it for production deployments when it broke? OK. So a bunch of you know, well-known websites were actually um, using Grunt, which is a, an equivalent tool to, to Gulp, except it's slightly more heavyweight, um, verbose, and a bit last year. Um, so uh, basically what happened was someone checked in some breaking changes to master and grunt, and it totally broke grunt. And then all of these people who were doing exactly the same thing using grunt to install all of the missing packages suddenly couldn't install packages anymore, which meant they actually couldn't deploy to production. And that's a bit awkward. So there was like an internet-wide panic for all the hipsters in Silicon Valley saying, oh my god, oh my god, grunt's not a thing, how do we actually deploy? And they couldn't. They had to wait until someone actually just reverted grunt. Some of them actually went to the point of just git cloning grunt, the grunt repository, reverting the change that broke their stuff, rolling their own grunt, and dropping it into the build pipeline, because that's not putting untested code into production. <laughs> <laughs> right. What was the title of this talk again? The professional way? Yeah, totally not. Yeah, let's not do that. OK. So at this point, we've got a decent build pipeline. We can be responsible about it. We've got automated tests. We've got the whole shebang all the way through to automated deployment and an IPA file. These ones, really, really quickly, um, who's not used Serilog? These slides will be up on SlideShare, by the way, so don't stress too much. OK, so not used Serilog, some people who has used Serilog. OK, who's used it and not liked it? Good, there'd be something wrong with you. OK, if you haven't played with Serilog, grab Serilog. Likewise, um, grab Seek. Um, it's free for a single user install, but you should totally pay Nick for it because it's totally worth it. And disclosure, yes, he's a friend, but that's fine. Um, what you care about, though, is on the device, tell me what happened. OK, now Seek and Serilog, well, Serilog is the structured logging tool of choice for .NET applications. Um, you can hit it directly via its API. If you can write your own code to do that, that's fine. Um, I tend to get a lot more mileage out of just having a slash API slash log method on my API and then logging that directly to Serilog. Because what that does is you can then hook like uh, window.onerror, you know, JavaScript window.onerror. So anything that goes boom, basically just log it back to the server. The server will then log it to seek, but with things like your logged in user context and all of the other useful things that you've got from you know, decoding your bearer token or your claim sets, all that sort of stuff. Um, likewise, uh, you can use uh, who's familiar with the decorator pattern? Decorator pattern, one, two, three. OK, decorator pattern, basically, I have a thing uh, which exports, or sorry, implements a particular interface. So in this case, the log interface. I wrap it in another thing, which also implements the log interface. Boom, decorator. OK, so the idea is you can wrap the Angular dollar log service. Uh, you can use that, you can decorate that with your own log that will also log back to your server. 
so you can actually see what on earth is going on within your app. And actually, I won't show you that now, but if people want to have a sticky peek afterwards, I've got a sync instance up here that we can play with. Um, Raygun, have a play with Raygun. There is no free plan. Sorry, question? Oh, that's right. Raygun, people have used it. Okay, there is no free plan. It's about $150 a month for a medium license, so it's you're not talking you know, lunch money. That, well, maybe talking lunch money. I don't know this crap. Um, <clears throat> but there is no free plan, but it's well worth a look. Raygun will aggregate your logs. So it's all very well. Something goes horribly wrong in production, and you just start getting streams of red coming down the console. All right, that's not very good. Um, Raygun will actually aggregate those for you, so it will say, hey, this is the first time I've seen this particular log message in production or this particular log message has been recurring for the past five minutes and it's increasing in frequency, maybe you want to do something about that. Okay, It's really, really useful, um, especially in high traffic websites where you're trying to look at logs and they're just streaming past and then you know, when you're in Netflix kind of territory, yeah, don't, don't, don't try to you know, read text log files. Um, last one I'd look at, New Relic. New Relic does have a free plan. You saw the instrumentation code. Um, it's as simple as for your servers, you drop a .NET agent onto a server and it will instrument pretty much everything just from doing that. Um, client side stuff, you stick your instrumentation code on there, you have to pay for that bit though. So, mileage may vary. So last things. Oops. Homework. And then that. Homework. Stuff you should Google with Bing. I'll leave for someone who can tell me who said that. Handsome. Someone, someone whispered handsome. Okay. So, Google with me. Um, John Papa, if you want an AngularJS style guide, uh, he is your person. All right. He is quietly opinionated, but not arrogantly opinionated. Um, he's got some really, really good style guides. Um, he's got a lot of thoughtful work on things like, if your app is this kind of shape, maybe make it follow these guidelines, whereas if you're solving this kind of problem, use that. So some really, really good tips there on how to actually structure an Angular app. Um, you're going to need to learn about TypeScript because TypeScript's future was a little bit uh, right up until Google bet big on it as well as Microsoft. So Angular v2 is written in TypeScript. TypeScript is a superset of ECMAScript, um, <laughs> which is also the future and it's been coming for like ever and it will be here real soon now. Um, Angular Seed is basically a repository that you can just clone. So Google Angular Seed, but basically um, Git clone or Git clone depth of one for an Angular Seed app, and that will just give you a starting application that does nothing. It's your Hello World app that you don't have to write. Okay. Marco versus Jasmine, Gold versus Chrome, App Builder versus PhoneGap. I don't really care which component you plug in where to your pipeline. We could add in Team City versus Team Build versus Jenkins versus whatever. Um, Except that you know, you're going to pay for phone gap one way or the other, unless you want to run your own build server, which you can. All right, so Google it with Bing homework, and finally, it can be home time. <laughs> Questions, anyone? Have you had a chance to look at what Apple's announced at WWDC last night about their build pipeline? Um, I haven't yet. No, it looks. So you're, you're no longer Yes, it looks interesting. I don't know yet what difference it's going to make as far as um, existing submission <coughs> process because they're not going to change that overnight. Um, the, the nice thing as well is that uh, whether it's uh, PhoneGaps Cloud Build or App Builder or whatever, um, that's their problem. So I basically get to say, here is my app bundle. Make it a whatever the App Store now wants, yeah, please. The short, the short version is so. bundles are getting too big for all the apps. Yeah, they're, they're splitting it so because yeah, you've got like you know, all of your different retina, iPad, iPhone, thing, 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 thing. Like you saw, what, how big, that was a seven megabyte bundle, right? Six and a half, 6.8 megabytes of that was just like images, like all splash screens and, and icons. So splitting it's going to be really useful. Um, I'm pretty confident that the, uh, the cloud build providers are just going to give you multiple downloads. Uh, so it should be relatively straightforward. We'll see. Questions? It can be home time? Do you lose the ability to have uh, your changes that you're making your JS files live sync to the app running on a device connected by USB? So that live sync ability that Apple gives you? So the way we're doing it here, yes, but you can also add another step into your Gulp Watch pipeline, which just drops them straight onto the file system for Apple. 
which will then do live sync locally anyway. Um, just that I'm tending to find now I don't get a huge amount of mileage out of the app builder simulator that I don't get out of just live reload in the browser. So the cool stuff that the simulator has, for instance, is uh, location emulation, uh, you know, some of the device specific characteristics. So pretend that I'm here, pretend that I move, pretend that I'm moving at 10k an hour that way. Um, that's about the only time I'm actually finding I'm using the simulator. For the rest of it, it's usually just tested in Chrome and Firefox and then um, dump it straight onto the phone, which I should add. I saved this until last because I'm actually using the phone to record voice, so apologies to people listening on the interwebs, but this is going to look a little bit awkward. But what we can do is this phone here, you can't actually see it, but this app here is the one that we just sent up. Well, sorry, it's the same one. It's the same environment that we've got. This is the old version of it, so if I go to my dashboard, you won't be able to see it too far away. But, hi, whoops, it's not my dashboard, it's the login. Sorry, sign out. Okay. And welcome to the Red Frogs app. That's all very nice. I'm going to just do a three-finger touch and hold. It's pulling down that bundle that we just changed. OK, so we did our change, welcome to the Brisbane.net user group. We did a git push. Our pipeline did its thing. And as soon as this bundle comes down, if it comes down, we'll get welcome to Brisbane.net user group. So we actually get live, I'll put that down again so it's not noisy. Um, we actually get live refresh straight off the phone. So again, in PhoneGap, that's called hydration. Uh, in App Builder, I don't know what it's called, but hold down three fingers. And that code change that we just made has just hit my phone. On that note, on that bombshell. Oh, wow. awesome.